Good afternoon and welcome to the latest edition of the Stargate uh, Universe Sci-Fi Cult Classics uh, documentary. I'm delighted to be joined by the one and only Gary Jones, who played uh, Sergeant Walter Harriman in uh, Stargate uh, SG-1. Uh, most fondly known to Stargate fans all over the world as the Chevron guy, uh, most commonly seen. I suppose, Gary, a Wales actor, a uh, Welsh actor, made the career jump over to Vancouver, starting off in terms of your career side to relocate over to Canada. Were you always, uh, were you a more theatre type of actor? Was sci-fi anything you had experienced over in the UK or was it, how did you get involved in the whole sci-fi world over in Vancouver? Well, first of all, I emigrated from Wales when I was like 10. Okay. So, um, I had zero aspirations to be an actor, like none. And uh, it was only when I was around 26 or so living in Ontario that I, um, that I thought that I would uh, try, Im try my hand at improv comedy, improvisational comedy. And I got hired through taking workshops at a, at a, at a sort of pre a prestigious theater in Toronto called Second City, which is where John Candy and Martin Short and Catherine O'Hara and all these people uh, came out of. And um, I was there for about two years. And then, and then uh, uh, Expo 86 uh, happened and uh, Second City decided that they were gonna put uh, a troupe at Expo 86 in Vancouver uh, to run for the duration of the fair. And I got asked to be part of the cast of that. And that included Ryan Stiles, um, so I worked with Ryan for about six months and then when the fair ended, uh, everybody else kind of like left and I stayed in Vancouver and started looking for work. And I guess around 1995, it, uh, it must have been in 95 or 97, I can't remember now, but that was when I had my audition for Stargate and I was just told by my, um, by my agent to go to go and audition for this show that they were making a TV show out of. And I had to watch the film again. And they, and she said, you know, don't mess it up because it may be a recurring role. It's like uh, the, this character might come back. Mm. And uh, in Canada, a lot of actors will tell you that, that if you, to, to be recurring, you only have to show up in two episodes. In other words, you, you were in an episode and then you recurred in another episode most people think about recurring characters as as people who um, are sort of ongoing, you know, not in every episode necessarily, but but sort of ongoing as a, as a recurring character. And I didn't think anything of it. I just went in and did my regular audition um, <clears throat> with no idea that it would turn into, a, you know, a 10 year gig. Mm -hmm. I had no clue. And also just just, <laughs> you know, Every actor is told to, when you go to an audition, you got to kind of bring something to the audition, something of yourself. And because I didn't really know, they hadn't made the show yet. So it's not like, it's not like you're already auditioning for an established show where you kind of know what the tone is and uh, you go, okay, well, I can adjust the, my audition tone for that, for that particular show. Like X-Files, everything is like super deadpan and, you know, like really low key delivery. And uh, because that show was already up and running, but Stargate hadn't started yet. And so I didn't know what, what the kind of tone was. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I could bring to the audition was comedy because that's all I knew. And so, <laughs> so my audition comprised of me just saying Chevron one encoded, Chevron two encoded, Chevron three with little breaks to other action scenes. And, um, and I kept, every time it came back to me, I would be like, Chevron 4 encoded, making it sound like I was almost annoyed that I was having to open up these Chevrons. And, uh, and then by the time it got to Chevron 7, I was like full on Jerry Lewis, like Chevron 7 locked. And I look over and Brad Wright and uh, all those guys, they're just killing themselves laughing. And, um, and I thought, oh, this is going well. But I had no idea that it that wasn't the tone, mm -hmm. you know? 
I was just like over the top comedy. But I found out later on when I spoke with Brad, he said, the reason why we hired you or brought you back and hired you was because you were the only actor who did any, who did anything with those, with the words. Okay. Everybody else just read them as like dead seriously. And, you know, that kind of had no personality to them. And I just, it's not that I, it's, I, you know, it's not that I have more personality than, than any other actors. Cause there's so many great actors in Vancouver. It's just that it's a, almost like a fluke. I only brought the thing, the one thing that I knew. Hmm. And I thought, well, if this doesn't work, who knows? And I got called back and I got the part. And then I was, then I was the technician for 10 years. And I suppose, Gary, when you got the part for of our original members of the show already cast, were you sort of aware who was going to be on the show? Did you agent tell you some of the cast members or? Was no, 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 they, no, they, they, they never tell you anything like that. I mean, I mean, the, the one thing they would say is like, oh, this is, the lead actor is Richard Dean Anderson. They would just say that, you know, it's it's Richard Dean Anderson is is playing uh, the the Kurt Russell reprising the Kurt Russell part, and he's Jack O'Neill, and uh, everybody else is like, who knows who they are, you know? People they just that's almost like a myth, or you know, people just don't do that. You know who the lead, you know who the main person is, and uh, but beyond that, like it, like I auditioned for Fargo uh, here the TV show a while back, you know, like a couple of years ago. Mm. And they didn't say, oh, this is a scene with uh, Martin Freeman, you know, or um, Billy Bob Thornton. They, they just don't tell you that. They just say, you're just auditioning for this part and go in and read for this part. And then I didn't get the part, but then I saw it later. And I was like, oh, that was a scene with Martin Freeman. You know, you just find out later. And I suppose, uh, Gary, in terms of uh, your on-screen uh, relationship uh, with Don, who played General Hammond, uh, there was an, a sort of take, uh, all the, in every sort of take, you were always together uh, in terms of, you just look up at that sort of room when SG-1 were barking and they'd see you, Walter, your character, and we'd, you'd see General Hammond, uh, just the uh, essence of you're always in that sort of shot together. And what was the sort of working uh, with, with uh, Don? Because you were probably in every sort of take uh, together. Uh, a very He looked a very sort of serious character. His character, General Hammond, but people say he was a very relaxed, chilled, mellow sort, type of individual. He was just, yeah, he looked... He looked pissed off in all his scenes. Mm. He was always like, kind of like, you know, almost like re ready to blow. Uh, but off camera, he was just a complete sweetheart. Great guy. Um, you know, an interesting thing about Dawn was uh, a friend of mine who is an actor here in Vancouver. She studied acting at uh, the University of British Columbia. And she told me, she told me one day, that Dawn used to be like the aunt, like the theater carpenter, mm. like at, at, at the University of British Columbia in the theater department. Dawn was the carpenter, right? No acting experience. And, but, but he had that, you know, he had a great look and he had that, that Southern, uh, you know, Missouri, you know, I'm from Missouri, you know, drawl, you know, mm. that he never lost. He had a great voice and everything. So we were laughing because she was saying, you know, they're all there working their asses off, trying to be actors and doing plays and, and, and uh, trying to get, you know, hoping to get out there in the world and get work. And, and Don would show up and he'd go, oh, hi, kids. Well, I just got asked to be in a commercial. And they're like, what? And they're like, do you have any acting experience? He's like, no, I don't know. I don't know why I'm doing this. And then he'd, then he'd land a commercial. And they're like, wow, that's that's great, Don, like sort of patronizing him, thinking, oh, that's like a little one-off for the, for the set carpenter. Then he comes in at one point, he goes, well, guess what? <laughs> I just got cast in, in some show. And they're like, what? You got cast in a show? He goes, yeah, it's called uh, Twin Peaks, uh, directed by David Lynch. And they're like, are you kidding me? You got cast in Twin Peaks. He's like, oh. like so Don would like kind of like be like, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> and then he got cast in Stargate. And 
he sort of fell into it, but he was just the loveliest guy to, uh, to work with. When I first met Don, he, uh, he, sh- he was a barrel chested, super strong guy. He would get up in the morning and he would do 500 push push-ups. Wow. He had arms, like his arms were gigantic. And he said, uh, he would do 500 push-ups. And, and I'd say to him, well, you might want to try sit-ups too, because that belly is not going anywhere. And uh, wow. so we had that kind of relationship. Yeah. And we would always, he would always say, you know, uh, are you in the next script? Because if you're in the next script, that probably means I'm in the next script. <laughs> and Don and I would joke around that a lot. And he shook my hand when I first met him and he said, hi, I'm Don S. Davis. I'm 235 pounds of romp and stomping Missouri bullshit. That was his introduction to me. And I was like, okay, this is the way it's gonna go. But he was he was like strong, barrel chested, the loveliest guy. At some points, really insecure about his acting, you know? If ever we had to do retakes, yeah, I bet you. I bet you some of the actors would tell the way. If, if ever we had to shoot again, like, okay, that was good. We're doing. We're 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 going again. You know, they do that all the time. They do yeah. a bunch. Of things. Don always thought that the reason they were doing the take again was because of him, because he messed up. Oh, what did I do? What did I, did I do? Something wrong? What did I? Was I not standing in the right place? And they're like, no, no, Don, no, Don, you were great. It was a lighting thing. No, Don, no, Don. It was like we couldn't quite hear the the mic. There's something wrong with the with the sound. But he, that was it. That was Don's go-to. Was like, oh, it's me. It's me. Didn't I ruin the take? What did I do? What did I do? Oh my God. And I don't know. I'll tell you one other funny story about Don. Uh, that just. It was the first time that I got really, really comfortable on set. It was a, it was a, um, it was being directed by Peter DeLuise and Pete, and we shot the scene and all Don had to tell me, he was standing behind me and all he had to say was, uh, open the iris, right? Yeah. He's like, open the iris. And I'm just sitting there at uh, my computer, cameras on both of us. And uh, after we shoot this scene, which, was fine. There was nothing wrong with it. Peter comes over to me and he whispers in my ear and he says, look, I want to shoot this scene again. Uh, even though there was nothing wrong with that previous one, but I want you to just kind of, just kind of go off on Don, like, just mm. say whatever you want. Like, just go, just go like break character kind of thing. Mm. Right. And I was like, really? And he goes, yeah, yeah. So he says that Peter says to the crew, he goes, all right, we're going again. And everybody's like, really? What? Like, Whoa. Why? Like nobody can figure yeah. out why. Peter goes, oh, I just want to try something else. I want to just see something else. And he's around the corner. And and so do the scene again and add action. And Don goes, uh, open the iris. And I just sitting there on my computer and I go, why don't you open your own fucking iris? And he goes, and you you can see like the the, the crew are like, Oh my God. And I go, oh, it's always open the eyes, close the eyes, open the eyes, close the eyes. So I go, why don't you do it for once yourself? You give, you're making me do it all the time. Why have I got to do it? You're just standing there, just yelling orders. You don't do anything. And I just went off on Dawn for like, for like five minutes. Yeah. And he didn't move. He didn't laugh. He didn't say anything. He didn't respond to me. So I just like kept going. And then finally I heard Peter DeLuise go, cut. He was laughing his ass off. And then, and then the whole crew cracked up and Don just looked at me and he just goes, there you go. Like that. I have pretty fond memories of Don, but those are my two kind of favorite stories that I remember about Don. And I suppose, uh, Gary, the actual set of uh, Stargate SG-1, that sort of gate room, that actual Stargate itself, it looks gigantic on TV. What is it actually really like when you're actually standing up close to you're walking down that ramp? And does it actually weigh a lot or is it very, or is it all cardboard effect or what's the actual, the whole set of us, is it, what's it like basically? Did you say, did you say, was it cardboard? No, I was just like in terms of uh, the sort of effects sometimes. Moving. The, the, the Stargate itself looked gigantic because it was gigantic. Okay. It was huge. 
that ramp was like a wide ramp. It was metal, uh, you know, with but like handrails down the side. And it went right up to the lip of the, of the, um, of the gate. And the gate itself was metal. I don't know how much it weighed, okay. but it had two rings and the inner ring, whenever they would, um, uh, whenever it would start, they would, they would sort of move and, uh, they would, you know, of course they just light it up with, um, you know, everything's lit. It was like a working practical is when, when something's working on set, like if you have a, if you have like a lamp lamps, uh, you know, like look, with lampshades on set or something they're called and they work, they're called practical uh, because they actually work. And it was a practical Stargate. The only thing it had behind it was, was just the wall of the soundstage. And they added the, they added the, um, the, the puddle and the collusion and all that in later in post-production. So, um, but it was big and it was pretty imposing. Uh, I remember in the first episode, Mario has a party, the first, the director who directed the first two parters, um, he was so proud of it. He was like, oh my God, wait till you see this thing. Oh my God, it's you. And he took us into the gate room and we we're like, wow. And I mean, but after 10 years, there's only so many times you can look at the Stargate and go, wow, it's huge. Like after a while, I just didn't care. And that actually helped my character because I was like, it was like, oh yeah, another day at the Stargate. It was like I was working at, you know, <laughs> whatever, some store or some. And I used to treat the Stargate like, a, like if there's something wrong with it that I, that I was uh, putting an air filter into a Ford Escort or something, you know, like just, oh yeah, we got to fix that thing again, you know, get that thing fixed, Siler, whatever. And uh, we just treated it like it was like a normal everyday thing. Which I, which I think, I believe, added to the kind of like re realness of it. You know, the authenticity of, of the everyday mundaneness of working how many stories below Cheyenne Mountain, you know, with the Stargate. And uh, Gary, in terms of the success of the show, after the second season, it just skyrocketed. It just took off to astronomical uh, uh, reasons, I suppose, uh, in terms of its popularity. But I, just in terms of um, Richard Dean Anderson, uh, come season five, season, season four, season five, his character, Jack O'Neill, had probably morphed into legendary status in terms of a sci-fi character, even rivaling his own MacGyver, even uh, surpassing. How did uh, Richard deal with that sort of character? Because sometimes he was probably, people saw him more as Jack O'Neill than Richard Dean Anderson. Yeah, I mean, I mean, when you think about it, Richard Dean Anderson had kind of hit the mother load on two iconic shows, like MacGyver, which is now in the lexicon. The, like to MacGyver something is like, you know, it's the same as Jerry Rig. You know, if you're gonna Jerry Rig something, you might as well, I'll just MacGyver this together, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so that shows the kind of the power of the, of the iconic uh, nature of the first show that he was in. And the second show, you, you had no, we had no idea. It, it really, what, see in MacGyver, it was mostly him, mm. right? But in, the, it, but in Stargate, it was the chemistry between the foursome that really, you know, he, that, that really the show took off with. You know, people love the mix of action, science fiction, uh, some comedic stuff, some humorous stuff, and just the whole, um, I think it was just how they dealt with other races and nations and planets, which it was very kind of Star Trekian in the, yeah. in the, you know, the first, you know, you know, you don't go to this planet and you don't pull a gun out the first thing, you know, uh, and aim it at somebody or threaten them. You, you know, you try and talk to them and find out about them and find out what's going on on their planet. And I think that, I think that the fact that that um, they yes they were soldiers and yes they had to defend themselves but essentially they they were mostly peaceful you know um, kind of warriors that went to other planets and I think people really liked that because because it just gave the show way more to work with than it did like oh we're on another planet let's start firing guns now you know. 
And I suppose, Gary, one thing I heard about the show, I know Amanda Tapping went in and did some producing later on in the show, uh, but the t characters, Michael Shanks, Christopher, Judge, Richard Dean Anderson, even after four or five seasons in, uh, they seemed to be really enjoying it all the time. It wasn't the case where it became tiresome or repetitive or they felt uh, maybe sort of overworked or what, uh, saw the project coming to a close. Uh, it almost felt like the, it was almost season four, it was almost like season one to them all over again. Well, I think there was a, first of all, as the seasons went by, I think, I think if I remember correctly, sci-fi or whoever was putting it on Showtime, I can't remember who now, but had said, okay, you have a five season commitment. And that's rare now. Like people just, you know, broadcasters just don't do that anymore. You yeah. know, you get like six episodes, maybe 12 episodes, and then, you know, we'll see how it goes. But with, with a show like this, back, it was, you know, it was back in the day when, when they would commit to seasons and I think anything after season five was just a was just a gift. And people were like, hey, we're renewed for season six. Then it was like season seven. I was like, wow, season seven, season eight. Oh, my God. Season nine. You're kidding me. And then, you know, as it went on, people were like, oh, my God. And I think that there was this sense of gratitude and fun and that people had jobs where they were like, you know, making good money. They were working actors. They were doing all sorts of things. Amanda now directs a lot, right? Like she's, she's doing that. Um, Richard Dean doesn't really, I don't think he does much now, yeah. but um, Michael Shanks is still acting. And Chris Judge is acting and does voiceovers and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, they've gone on to do other things. All the other actors have gone on to do to do other things. Um, but yeah, like people, I think there was that sense of joy that that, oh, my God, this show is actually happening, you know. Mm -hmm. And I suppose, Gary, in terms of being on set and the numerous uh, guest stars that will appear, every from Tony Todd uh, to Lou Gossett, uh, even in Stargate Atlantis, the likes of Colin Meany, Robert Davy uh, appeared on episodes, uh, iconic actors in their own right. Uh, do, were you aware maybe in the scripts of would you just come from Monday morning and you'd see these actors would turn up and oh, they're shooting an episode this week. And after a while, did it become sort of a norm where you were like, oh my God, that's Robert Davy, that's Colomini, or did you feel like, well, that's, that's just the norm. It's happening on a regular basis. It was the norm. You, you, well, you have to, if, <clears throat> if you act all starstruck, I think it affects your work. You have to kind of go in there going, well, they're on this show and I'm on this show. Yeah. Yes, they're more famous than me, but I'm worthy enough. My talents are worthy enough to put me on the same show as these, you know, really established actors. So I would just, and, and you know, offset, they're, they're really nice people and you chat with them and, you know, you don't go partying with them, but, but they, they're nice enough, just regular people. And of course, they're there to do a job. Everybody's there to do a job. And they, and they just look around and they go, okay, that's him doing his job. Here am I doing my job. It's just a job, you know, <clears throat> but I will tell you a funny story about one of my friends who called me up and uh, said that he had a, um, he said that he had uh, an audition for Stargate SG-1 and he was like, oh my God, I finally got an audition. And, and this guy was a really funny guy. He was short and kind of round and sort of bald, right? And he, I said, well, so what's the part? And he goes, well, I'm an alien I, uh, from, you know, I'm some, some kind of alien. And he said, but the, he said, but the, but the script is pretty funny. Um, and he goes, do you think I have to do anything with it or, or push it or be any certain way? And I said, and this guy was already very funny guy to talk to just naturally. And I said, and I, and it turns out that I was in that episode and I had the script with me. And I said, well, let me look it up. I got the script right here. So I looked it up and I read through his scenes and I said, um, I said, you don't have to do anything. This script is funny enough that you just need to go in and be yourself and say your lines. Right. Yeah. 
So he goes in, he reads, it goes really well. He calls me back and he says, oh my God, that went really, really well. It was great. So I'm just waiting to hear now whether or not I'm cast. And I said, well, well done. I, I said, we could be on set together. And that was always a fun thing to spend time on set together with your friends, right? So a couple of days go by. And because Stargate was a weekly show, if you didn't hear like kind of like the next day, it'd be like, mm, wonder what happened. Call your agent, check in, right? Whatever. So he calls me the next day and he's uh, like two days later. And he says, he says, I haven't heard anything. I, have you heard anything? And I said, no, 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 they don't call me. Like if you haven't been cast, they're not going to call me and say, by the way, your friend, Mike Roberts hasn't been cast. So I said, I don't know. I have no idea. So I get to set and the director was Will Waring and uh, who used to be a camera guy, but they've yeah. given him an episode to direct. And I go up to, to Will, just say hi, say, hey, fr- hey, Will, I'm just on set, what, you know, just arrived. And he goes, huh, guess what? Guess who's on this show? Uh, guess who got, we, we got as a guest star? And I'm like, I, I don't know. And he says, he says, uh, Wallace Shawn. Okay. Right, Wallace Shawn, I was like, no way. And, and he goes, yeah, yeah, he's playing the alien. And I said, oh, oh, you got Wallace Shawn. I said, you know, a buddy of mine, Mike Roberts, uh, audition for that part he didn't get obviously you got Wallace Shawn and he goes oh he goes here's what happened he goes Mike Roberts did a fantastic job he was so good in fact that as we're watching him in the casting room one of the writers I think it was uh uh uh, what are their names Jim Jim Malazzi and uh, Paul Mooley they were they were the uh, producers and they're watching Mike audition and Joe writes on a slip of paper um, to Paul and slides it over and says, reminds me of Wallace Shawn. And Paul Mooley looks at it and he goes, he just goes, oh, think we can get Wallace Shawn? And he slides it back and they're going, oh my God. So they call Wallace Shawn's agent and he was just, he was in the middle of doing a play in New York, but he had a couple of days off where he could fly up to Vancouver do Stargate and fly back. So my friend who kind of, he did remind people of Wallace Shawn, reminded the producers enough that they actually hired Wallace Shawn. And I told my friend and I said, you idiot, you you were so much like Wallace Shawn that they hired Wallace (laughs) Shawn. And he's like, oh my God. And he said, well, at least, at least, you know, my acting was, was up there enough, but that was, such a funny story to share with uh, with my buddy. You know, it's pretty funny. And I suppose, uh, Gary, in terms of uh, recurring roles for the original members of Stargate at SG-1, they appeared in Atlantis, a sort of a spin-off show, and you had many uh, episodes in Atlantis as well, uh, working beside Tori Higginson, Higginson uh, who played um, the main uh, sort of boss, the sort of General Hammond type character. How did that sort of come about in terms of Stargate Atlantis? Was it just to try and sort of blend them, the two of them together that you were appeared in a good lot of episodes? Uh, I have no idea how it came about. I wasn't, I wasn't in on that. I mean, I can only assume that that, you know, they just thought, well, there's this other Stargate and it's in Atlantis and like, let's, here's another fantastic location with like umpteen uh, storylines. And I think what they, what that allowed them to do then was occasionally they could do crossover episodes because of the commonality of the Stargate, you know? And uh, on my, on my acting reel, I actually have a scene in a in a lunchroom between me and Jason Momoa that I that I'd forgotten about when I was putting my acting reel together. I thought, oh my god, I I've I've done it. I've actually done a scene with Aquaman, and I went back, and it's just me and Jason, who's a lovely guy. Um, it was really great, and it meant a lot for me to be in a scene with him. And it's a funny little scene, but um, you know there were all these different. You could just they could just kind of play around and do all these different things and have all these little crossovers, you know, Mm. Um, just because they wanted to do a show that opened that up for them. 
And I suppose a quick uh, sort of question now on uh, Christopher Judge. I suppose his character, Teak, uh, sort of a uh, sort of a uh, short uh, mannered type of guy. Didn't say much words. A sort of a daunting, imposing character, but a very jovial uh, person. Offset, uh, a very fun uh, sort of guy and there was episodes where they got to explore that sort of thing in terms of his character in terms of his real life personality when they switched uh, bodies or switched sort of identities or stuff like that but in terms of Christopher uh, in terms of his ability as an actor uh, do you think the character Teak was just because of the way he was put about this imposing Jaffa that said very little words that did it make him more menacing in terms of uh, that? You mean in the show? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, what was really cool about, about Teal's character was that, you know, you start off with, like with any show, you know, you start at the beginning and you introduce these characters and you, and you think that you have them kind of pinned down. But then, you know, as the show goes on year after year after year after year, you have got to open it up. You've mm -hmm. got to do something with it. You can't just have Teal saying, indeed, you know, like it, we're past that now, you know? And so when they did show, when they did um, episodes where they were like, uh, where they were going back in time to like 1969 and they were all yeah. dressed up in, in hippie gear and you've got Teal, you know, dressed up and they're just at that point, they're just having fun because it's like time traveling, mm -hmm. but Teal is part of the group and they're just having a laugh. That's really all they're doing. Um, and they're going, what else can we do with these characters to explore these characters and, you know, deepen the friendship between the characters? Because they were friends. Mm. They were fr they were workmates, but they were friends on the show uh, uh, as characters. And you just get to kind of deepen that. Chris off screen is just like a walking party. Okay. He just laughs at everything. He farts before every take, really loud farts, mm -hmm. you know, before they yell action. And uh, he was kind of known for that. So everybody, they'd yell, they, they were both yell action. He'd crack one, everybody would laugh, and then they'd have to do the scene. And, uh, but he was like that all the time. He was just goofing around, laughing like crazy, and uh, he was the polar opposite of Teal'c. I suppose, uh, Gary, last question now before I let you go. In, let's say there was a Stargate uh, universe sort of encyclopedia, a dictionary, and they put your character, Sir Walter Harriman, in the dictionary, and they left two blank sentences underneath it, and they asked you to write those two sentences. What would you like those two sentences to read? Oh, my God. You're, you're putting me on the spot, but, uh, you know, uh, he was there day in, day out, opened the iris, closed the iris, never left his chair, um, and, uh, ex and could fix every computer uh, Stargate-related problem, except when Amanda Tapping pushed him out of the way and Sam Carter fixed the problem because ultimately she knew more than him. Uh, on that note, uh, Gary Jones, a pleasure talking to you this evening to relive your memories of your time in Stargate SG-1 uh, playing uh, Sergeant Walter Harriman. And uh, no doubt, uh, Gary, uh, in the future, if there's another Stargate movie around the corner in 2021, you might see a cameo role for Walter Harriman uh, in the near future, please, God. Well, uh, Gary, a uh, pleasure that's... talking to you. Lovely to talk to you, Jim. Take care, man. Take care.